First thing that comes to mind uh, when Jared was talking about uh, anarchy and individualism and stuff is that our concept of an individual is actually quite new, uh, historically speaking, really only reaching its uh, uh, current form in the last maybe couple hundred years, and only for some people. Uh, and and you know, having evolved over maybe a couple thousand years, but it's still kind of um, an aberration uh, for human beings to even think of themselves primarily as an individual, rather than primarily as a member of some larger group. And today, social science is also uh, affirming that we're not these, you know, kind of discrete, separate, separate, free-willed bubbles of psychology inside of these flesh robots, but that, that we're, our, our very identity and our very being is a social construct. We, you can say that what we really are is the totality of our relationships. Anybody who's ever been in a, how many people have been in a sensory deprivation tank? There's one in Baltimore now. There's one in Baltimore now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah Robin does about all these kinds of things. Um, <laughs> So you go in there, you know, and uh, you know what they are like. There, there's uh, body temperature water, you know. It's 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 uh, there's it's all soundproofed. It's dark, you know, and so you have essentially no relationship. I mean, not only with people, but no relationship with materiality at all. You know, you're you're cut off from all of your relationships, and very very quickly your identity begins to fall apart. So this this these kind of um, you know, discrete kind of semi-permanent selves that we identify with are nothing of the sort. And I think that that a lot of the conversations around anarchism or libertarianism and all these things that kind of take um, the the discrete, separate individual as a, an atomic unit um, are all based on a false premise. So you could look at. But certainly today, we, we, as never before, think of ourselves in that way. And it's no, no mystery why uh, our, we're embedded in an ideology that says that about us, and also an economic system that makes it very much seem that we are on our own, uh, and, and that our relationships with others are very much other relationships. Uh, competitive relationships, for example, or if not competitive, just very alienated, you know, you don't, it doesn't, it sure doesn't seem that your well-being or even your being depends on the well-being or being of anybody else, you know, like, as far as I'm concerned, my conditioned mind says, as far as I'm concerned, you guys could after I walk out of here, you guys could disappear off the face of the earth and it wouldn't affect me at all. Because I'm separate from you. And this is something that our society reflects at us. But it wasn't true for most people ever living on earth because we were in very tight communities of one sort or another. Uh, villages or, or tribal bands. And in those situations, if somebody disappeared, your life would be profoundly affected. Uh, both psychologically and economically, because people took care of each other. Now, I, I, I very much resonate with what Jared was saying, that um, this whole trajectory of humanity is happening for some kind of reason, not just to reach some pinnacle of 10 billion, 11 billion people, uh, and then to devolve once more back into a tribal world, uh, and and to you know, but but looking at the effects of civilization, it's um, quite understandable that many people would um, envision such a future, kind of a devolution into tribalism, and uh, a return to stone age or early agricultural population levels as the only. Um, realistic and desirable outcome for for our planet because you know look what civilization is doing and it's not just 
you know, the, the, the depredations of civilization aren't just kind of these incidental things that, you know, if only we had, you know, been slightly more enlightened, it wouldn't have happened. They're, they're very deep, deeply written into the fabric of civilization. Uh, the, for example, the conquest of nature. You know, we, we, we can criticize the idea of conquering nature as some kind of, uh, you know, uh, barbaric industrial revolution delusion. But you can trace that thinking back to the, to the very birth of civilization, which was an expansion of the domestic realm uh, and uh, bringing order to the wild. I mean, the first signs of civilization were, were things like canals, uh, you know, to control the floods and, and domestication, of course, uh, bringing, you know, imposing human design onto the wild. And so this uh, thread, um, this, this, you know, idea of um, separation of human from nature isn't incidental. To civilization, and so a lot of people will say, "Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, Daniel Quinn, you know, Derek Jensen. These people say, yeah, civilization is the problem, and it's not just that we have the wrong kind of civilization. It is fundamentally the problem, and the only way out, the only um, desirable outcome that we could possibly imagine is that civilization disintegrates, and we wake up, come back to our senses, and return to the." to the wholeness and the enchantment, the beauty, uh, the harmony, uh, the, the you know, ecological ways of hunter-gatherers, or maybe you know, primitive agriculturalists, and, and that's the only desirable future. But I, I, I can't, um, that never really s sat right with me, uh, that this is all just one big mistake. Because there's a lot of beautiful, amazing creations that are only possible with civilization. Endless variations on our creative capacities. And it's not that we weren't creative, artistic, clever, and so forth, as hunter-gatherers. But as creative beings, we constantly seek out new forms of creative expression. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. And I don't think that these unique gifts that humans have, that we could group under the categories of culture and technology, I don't think that these unique gifts are nature's big mistake. That, that you know, that's just as much a kind of human exceptionalism as to say that we're exempt from the laws of nature. To say that, yeah, we have these, these, these gifts of our of hand and mind, you know, that, that symbolic culture, technology, language, um, mathematics, you know, science, all of these things, but they're just a big mistake, and there is no evolutionary purpose for these things. That is, um, you know, that's saying that, that, yeah, our gifts are superfluous, and that's the same mindset that in former times said, yeah, you know, some species in nature are superfluous and we can engineer a better solution. We can, you know, eliminate the harmful species and, and foster the beneficial species and manage and control nature and, you know, engineer a better world. Uh, I think that's all part of this mindset that I like to call the old story, realizing that it's actually not that old a story. So the question then is, what is, if, if we have, if our gifts are, are, are um, here for a reason, if our species is here for a reason, if this whole ascent of humanity uh, into uh, a mass society, a mass interconnected uh, global society, if this is all happening for a reason, then what is that reason? What is the, the purpose of our gifts? Because whatever that purpose is, if it is supposed to be of benefit to all, all beings and to the, the development of this planet, we sure haven't been using them in that way. So what is the purpose? Why are we here? And I think that these are the deep questions that underlie our current crisis, our current 
convergence of crises. You know, it's not just kind of a technical crisis. It's not just um, a matter of fixing our systems, tweaking some things, re-engineering a couple things, and uh, perpetuating the can-do engineering mindset uh, and, and even expanding it and intensifying it. I think that we all understand that, that the crisis of civilization uh, asks deeper questions. It's, it's driving us to ask deeper questions as each level of solution is revealed as insufficient. And we've just actually begun this process. Most people today seem to think that the solutions are quite near at hand. If only they would get it, you know? If only they would, the, the oil companies would get it or the politicians would get it. We could have wind power and solar energy and everything would be fixed. We could have, you know, negative interest currency and everything would be fixed. I don't know who's propagating that idea. <laughs> and I'm not saying that these things are not part of a more beautiful world. But they come from something deeper. They fit naturally into uh, what I like to call the new story. Uh, a different mythology. Whereas our current systems of money, of technology, of politics, of criminal justice, of schooling, all of these things all fit into uh, the old story, an old mythology that, and that answers these deep questions in a certain way and which isn't working very well anymore. So really what we're facing today is uh, a shift in our mythology in our fundamental ways of answering uh, questions like, you know, who am I? Why am I here? What is a human being? What is, yeah. you know, an individual? What is a human being? Uh, what's the purpose of a human being? What's the purpose of humanity? How does the world work? <clears throat> All of the answers to these things are changing. Having uh, you know, planned to get here around noon and just arrived, uh, it's uh, reminding me uh, of kind of the futility of planning. <laughs> I mean, sometimes it makes sense to plan, uh, and it made sense for me to make to plan this trip. I mean, there's always some unknowns, you know. But you know, I planned. Okay, uh, um, here's my route. You know. 83 south and so forth, and here's the speed that I'll be able to travel, here's the time I need to get there, starting, ending time. It makes sense to plan under those conditions. When you know how to get from here to there, you know, you know first of all, you have to know where you're going, and secondly, you have to know how to get there. And we're, we're very used to solving problems in that way. Um, and that is a useful way to solve any problem that we know how to solve. For example, if you want to, if you're an engineer and you want to build a bridge uh, or a building, uh, if you are a college student and you want to become an accountant, you know there's um, a sequence of actions that you can take that will predictably, according to what you understand about how the universe works, get you from point A to point B. Uh, I'd like to offer you that humanity, collectively. And many of us personally are not at that point right now. Uh, instead, we're at a point, either we're, we're at point A and we don't like it, and we know that there's a point B, but we don't know where it is yet. Or we've caught a glimpse of point B. We've caught a glimpse of a more beautiful world. We've caught a glimpse of something possible for our own lives, but we have no idea how to get there. 
maybe will at most, it's like, it's like standing, uh, here's, you're standing on a hilltop and it's getting mighty uncomfortable there and you see this golden destination. And humanity has seen it. We get these glimpses of it in these uh, people power uprisings sometimes. Uh, maybe in the 1960s, you know, maybe uh, at Burning Man. Um, we get these glimpses, maybe just in small settings, maybe in Occupy Wall Street, you know, where everybody's doing exactly what's necessary, exactly at the right moment, and no one's being paid to do it. They're not doing it because they're paid. They're not doing it because they're commanded. They're not being uh, psychologically manipulated into doing it. Everybody is just offering their gifts, and it just seems that the right person shows up at the right moment, and you realize this is how society can work. And then the experience ends, and you go back to real life, uh, and begin to doubt maybe that you know maybe that was just some kind of delusion or some kind of you know special time, but it couldn't be the way reality works, right? Yet after those experiences, you go back to reality and it seems a little less real because the experience of something different has lodged inside of you. And this happens on a personal level too, um, when you have an experience that doesn't fit into the fabric of reality as you've known it. Could be, you know, a spiritual experience, a psychedelic experience, uh, uh, a miraculous experience, something like that. So we've caught glimpses individually and collectively of this destination. And there it is out there. But at most, maybe we see a couple steps of the path right here, and then over there, there's a little glimpse of the path there, and a little glimpse of the path there. You know, we know a few things about perhaps how to get there, but, but when we begin following that path, it very quickly descends down into jungles, uh, into swamps. And as we walk it, sometimes we don't even know what direction we're, we're, we're headed. Sometimes following this path, it seems like we're headed backwards, that things are getting worse, that things are hopeless. We look up and there's just trees around us and we can't even see that destination anymore. So a lot of us are standing at this place. And it could be that you know that there's another way to live. Theory, you know that it's possible to, and I don't know, like, I mean, people, I'm sure in this room are in many, many different places. Uh, you know that it's possible to live your life um, as an expression of your gift and not enslaved to money, but maybe you're not, you know, it's possible in theory, but you have no idea how to make that happen because you feel so trapped by the mortgage, for example, by the health insurance, you know, um, or, or by what people think or just, you know, honestly being afraid of uncertainty, uh, or uh, not even necessarily knowing really what you want to do. And maybe some people are, have left that uh, hilltop and are in the forest, in the jungle, walking this path. Maybe some of you are in those parts of the territory that are uh, very dark, and you go for a long time without being able to look up and see that there's a destination. Maybe even doubting that you ever saw it. Except at the moments of greatest despair, something reminds you and keeps you going. And maybe some people are, are in different territory where you're really having the experience of progressing toward that destination. Maybe some of you, I mean this isn't actually as linear as I'm, as I'm making it out, maybe some of you are already at that destination at least for a couple hours a day, or a couple days a week, or a couple days a month, you know, and, and, and filled with that, yeah, this is how life is supposed to be. This is what it feels like to be in the full expression of my gifts to be, to be a free person. So what's true personally is also true collectively. And so we have um, 
and all these visionaries saying, here, here, here's what the world could be. If only we adopted this, 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 and that solution. Um, and I, I know that, that um, the Zeitgeist Baltimore people are, are, uh, are you guys like the official organizers of this? Or, yeah. So that would be an example. You know, they, they have, um, uh, I would maybe, maybe not a comprehensive vision, but definitely um, a multifaceted vision of what the world could be. And there are many, many others that often write to me, um, and they say, they say, look at our plan, you know, Charles. Um, and, 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 the, and their idea, so look at our vision, and the idea is that, is that um, I'm going to look at it, and it's going to be so persuasive that I'm going to say, yeah, that's just, that's got to be the way it's going to be. Uh, and I will join forces with them, and I will uh, then go about uh, persuading everybody else um, uh, that this is the you know uh, most logical, rational, uh, uh, practical path forward for us. So. I mean, all the time, you know, Charles. You know, like, like, like we're, getting, we're getting this this little like, you know, think tank together, this little work work group together. You know, we're gonna come up with with the perfect plan. Or come up, maybe they want. It's more humble than that. You know, we're gonna come up. We're gonna work out the solutions essentially. And I think that there's. Um, I'm not usually very excited um, to join efforts like that. Partly just because I'm like really busy and stuff, but also like the whole idea that that. The way to create a better world is for all the smart people to get together in a room. And I mean, the first step is you've got to figure out whose plan is the best. So how do you do that? Well, everybody argues for their plan. You know, that's the internet chat room. You know, everybody like debating and debating and debating. And you never even get to step two. No one ever even figures out. Uh, who, you know, no one's, is, it's, it's not like there's this marketplace of ideas and the winner emerges and the winner is the one that's the most logical and the most based on evidence. You never even get to step two, which would be everyone's agreed on it now, now let's, you know, present it. Let's make a white paper, you know, let's make a manifesto. And, and people are going to, you know, once the, once the uh, politicians and the people in power, once they see this, they will be persuaded because it's just irrefutable because here's all the evidence you know and here's the logic and 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 how could you disagree with that you agree that one plus one is two right well you're a rational person here's the evidence here's the logic you know how could you disagree and and you'll see that frustration uh, if you go go to a, like a libertarian website you know you see that frustration how can people not get it you know because we're right, and it's so obvious. But you go to, to you know, a liberal website, and it's the same thing. So everybody is agreeing on something. Everybody's agreeing that the problem is the, all those dumb people out there. <laughs> all the ignorant people who just won't accept evidence, and they're, they're not open-minded. And probably a lot of us think that when we're confronting, I don't know, climate change deniers, uh, or something like that. Or, I mean, I could probably pick something that will tweak people, you know, like, how about when you're confronting uh, anti-vaccine <laughs> activists, you know, who just, like, they just won't accept basic science. <laughs> or how about when you confront uh, pro-vaccine activists, you know, who are uh, uh, blindly accepting the... Uh, pharmaceutical company propagated dogma, you know? Like, I mean, either side, uh, you, you can create this whole story about, about how the problem is that the other side is deficient in um, intellect or ethics. So everybody's in agreement on that. But maybe everybody's wrong. Maybe people don't actually make decisions based on evidence and logic. There's evidence for that, in fact. <laughs> I 
I'm a little hesitant to, to talk about it because there's Marie and Lori and a few people who have heard me speak enough times that they've probably heard this already. Is it all right? No? Because that's a reality. Most people make decisions. Yeah, why do people make decisions? Okay, let me just mention the evidence. Um, I mean, it keeps, I keep reading about it, but, but you know, there's studies, one from University of Michigan that was really well known, um, one from Yale more recently, that basically they just confront you. You're a participant in the study, and they confront you with evidence that, that contradicts something you believe. So what do you do? Well, if you're like most people, you don't change your mind. You harden your beliefs. You become even more convinced of the thing that the evidence contradicts. But none of you would do that, right? <laughs> because you're educated. Well, sorry, um, but the more educated you are, the more likely you are to do this. Because you're practiced at it. So, so what, what, if, what if I got up here, and I don't know how many of you, you know, accept the conventional climate change narrative, uh, which I kind of, to be honest, kind of half accept, or maybe two-thirds accept. Um, but suppose I got up here and I had PowerPoints and, and, um, and all of, you know, and I, and I basically made a really strong case that uh, climate change isn't really happening or that it's not caused by human beings. And I've been making, I've been doing this presentation for two years now, and it's polished. And I've, and no matter what objection you raise, I can rebut it because, oh, well, you know, that study that you're that you're citing, actually, there's all of this data that they excluded from the study, and that, 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 right? No matter what, and you don't know, you know, you haven't studied. How do you know? Maybe what I say is true. Maybe it isn't. You can't rebut me. So here I've laid out all the evidence. What, are, are you going to change your mind? No. No. You're going to go home and you're going to look up a website of somebody who can rebut the evidence. <laughs> you're not going to change your mind. And if it's the opposite scenario, if you are a climate change, change skeptic and I come up here and I make a really strong case that climate change is happening and it's accelerating and it's dangerous and uh, you know, maybe my name is Guy McPherson, and and I make the case that we're going to all that humanity is going to perish within 50 years because there's going to be six or eight degrees Celsius of global warming. And and you're a climate change skeptic. Are you going to change your mind? No. You're going to go home and you're going to look up the people who agree with you and their rebuttals of these points. So this is really important to realize because if you want to be a change agent in this world, then you better be operating in reality and not under the delusion that people are going to change their mind when you bring a powerful enough evidence-based case. And I'm not saying that it's always useless to do that. Um, sometimes people want to change their minds because their beliefs aren't working for them anymore. And you can offer a new story that and, and the evidence and the logic are part of that telling of that story. And they give the gatekeeper, the rational mind, permission to believe. So I'm not saying that these things are useless, but I think that they're much more powerful when they become uh, storytelling tools. They're secondary. Um, so that, that and, and so I'm, I'm going on this tangent uh, because the, the opening um, kind of query or invitation that Jared uh, gave us uh, was, was the idea that you know we need um, a common vision. If we're going to have, if we're talking about democracy, you know, if we're talking about um, uh, the collective self-determination of the people of this planet for uh, a purpose that serves all, we have to have, you know, it's like that, that metaphor of walking on this path, you know, we have to at least, in order to, to, to not fight each other, you know, in order to, to um, coordinate our creativity, coordinate our efforts, we have to all be walking on the same path. 
to some extent. We have to be all heading in the same direction. We have to agree that there is a place to go and what that is. And, and that's why I'm, I'm talking about you know, how to do that. And invoking the, it's more than a metaphor, uh, invoking the, the framework of storytelling, of narrative. Because why do some people, if it's not intellectual or moral deficiency, why do some people hold one set of beliefs and another, another person you know, holds another set of beliefs? It's because those beliefs make sense inside of a larger story. And if that larger story stays intact, then you're not going to change their mind. You can't um, can I explain it. OK, well, is it OK if I give an example? I'll give you an example from my book, my recent book. Um, and hopefully it won't be uh, tiresome to those who have read it. But so there's, there's this, uh, uh, you know, I spoke at a conference and there was a speaker before me um, who is a Nestle Corporation vice president. And she was sharp. She was an excellent speaker. And she really had her, and she had her material well organized. And she was saying, like, hey, you know, we're not the bad guys. We're really conscientious and taking every opportunity we can to reduce the environmental harm, the ecological impact of all of our activities across the company. Uh, for example, one thing we're doing is we've, we've led the industry in reducing the plastic content of water bottles by 40%. And, and you know, she listed all these other things, you know, we're helping orangutans, you know, and, and you know, preserving ecosystem. And, and you know, she gave a presentation. And um, <laughs> what was that guy's name? Uh, one guy, he's a, a kind of alternative currency activist guy. No, 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 he wasn't there. He was, he was... No, Alpha wasn't there. There's was some guy. A, a leftist guy that had to walk out of the auditorium because he felt <laughs> nauseous. <laughs> uh, but you know, so there, that, you know, so then after she was done, I happened like oh, I want to meet this lady, you know. So I went up to meet her, and there was um, a young young woman, a college student, who was asking her questions one on one, and she, and she said like, well, you know, wouldn't it be better instead of using forty percent less plastic, wouldn't it be better to use no plastic at all? And the woman, the Nestle VP, who maybe we would like to think of as some monstrous individual, some, uh, you know, uh, apologist, some, some uh, conscious, duplicitous apologist for the corporation, uh, who would like to, you know, think, like, like, what would it take for someone to, to do that? make those arguments, you know, um, to actually believe them. I mean, she seemed so sincere. Is she just a really good, evil actress? You know, that's one explanation. That she is part of this evil power elite that, that tells one story, but not, doesn't believe a word of it. Um, and that way of thinking, you know, you you expand that and you get the New World Order, you know, the Illuminati, um, and, and this idea that, that, that the evil of the world is happening because of evil people. It seems quite reasonable. You know? Evil people do evil things. What's the solution then? Destroy the evil people. Overcome the evil people. And now we're back to the conquest paradigm that started with the conquest of nature. Evil was a concept that was only invented, actually, when we began to try to conquer nature. And evil was associated with chaos. You see it in Greek mythology. Good is associated with order. And, and we're very comfortable with that. I mean, there's a certain comfort. If you've ever delved into these conspiracy theories, you know, it's like, ah, now I understand. You know, it fits into a comfortable framework now. And there's somebody to hate. And, I mean, it would be nice, you know, if we could just apply the same old 
mindset of ah, killing the bad guy, fighting, winning. Wouldn't it be nice if that was the nature of the problem? But in fact, and I'll admit, you know, when you read the conspiracy literature, it seems sometimes like, like very persuasive. You know, it's like, how can all of these coincidences line up, you know? Marilyn Monroe's psychotherapist was also counseling Lee Harvey Oswald or something like that, you know? I mean, there's like all of these things. Like, and I'm, I'm, that's a bit of a caricature of it. I mean, some of them are really like, you know, every single member of the Warren Commission, you know, went on to whatever. Like, there's, I mean, it, these, these um, coincidences kind of converge into an entire, into a narrative that when you dive into it, uh, there's no escape. You, know, you keep discovering more and more confirmation. And I guess I could talk about confirmation bias and all these other kinds of psychological things, but, but let's just say it kind of takes on its own reality. Anyway, we're comfortable with that. Um, and so it's very tempting to see the Nestle lady as you know, just some kind of uh, duplicitous monster. And so she said, her response to you know, using 40% less plastic and you know, what about using no plastic? What about not having water bottles? She said, well, did you know that if we didn't use these petroleum byproducts to make plastic, they'd be dumped into the environment anyway. We're just using the byproducts from the, from the petroleum industry. So we're really not even doing any harm. Secondly, bottled water is much better for people than other bottled drinks. And people are on the go. You know, they need these kind of things. And thirdly, we are um, making improvements all the time to reduce the ecological impact. And the college student didn't really know what to say. So I thought, you know, what's the larger story that the Nestle lady is acting from? So if you take for granted that the petroleum industry as it stands is unchangeable, and that's just the way it is. If you take that for granted, if you take for granted that life is speeding up and speeding up and speeding up, and that we need all this convenience, if you take for granted that technology is marching forward and that we will solve one problem after another, that no problem is too great, then if you take those things for granted, then her arguments are irrefutable. But to, to rebut those things, is very difficult, and it seems totally naive and and um, ingenuous to even attempt to rebut them. I had this conversation in uh, where was it at a conference? Um, yeah, I was at an HR conference. I was at I was speaking at an HR conference somehow. Uh, they brought in me and John Perkins too to be provocative. Like it was actually a really, really interesting conference. But I, was, I had a conversation with a business professor John afterwards. Perkins, yeah, 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 yeah. Really interesting guy. I met him at the airport. He didn't mind. You met him at the airport. His wife and son. Uh huh. Very nice. Yeah, yeah. Really nice guy. And, and interestingly, like um, you know, he started off writing about money and the economic system, and then he kind of migrated. Now he writes about shamanism, you know, and the indigenous and stuff like that. Um, so he's. Uh, there was, he's not the only one who's kind of walking that path. Um, Chris Martinson also. You know, I don't know if you guys, the, the crash course, really smart guy, not interested in money anymore. And I'm not actually that interested in money anymore either. Not that I ever was like, too immersed in it. But anyway, so, um, am I acting narcissistic now? <laughs> if I wasn't, now I am. Um, yeah, so, yeah, this business professor, um, he asked, well, you know, what, 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 you know, what, what do you do? And I said, ah, you know, I somehow the ascent of humanity came up, and which is the, you know, my first like large book, and and I said, yeah, you know, it's kind of a, a social history of technology and the meta narrative surrounding it, and and but it's a, you know, the title is semi semi ironic, and he was like, what's so ironic about that? And I said, well, you know, like you could make the case that, that 
humanity is not ascending, but that things are getting worse and worse. And it's like, that's ridiculous. You know, what about the benefits of modernity? No one would, would exchange their lives with that of a hunter-gatherer. You know, lifespan was 30 years old, you know, informal mortality this and that and that and that. You know, like, that, that someone would even broach that argument was inconceivable to him. And I said, well, you know, if you read, you know, Stone Age economics, you know, if you read an anthropology about this, you know, hunter-gatherers, life wasn't nasty, brutish, and short. It wasn't this, you know, uh, bare struggle for survival that, that we were just eking out until finally, thanks to technology, we were able to have more comfortable lives. I mean, that's, that is a mythology. It's not the truth. But, like, that was, seemed absurd to him. But once you grant that premise, then everything that Nestle is doing kind of makes sense. So these are, the, these are the deep stories. And if we don't change the deep stories, then we're only going to have, at best, superficial change in our institutions and our systems. And that's not to say that we shouldn't address the institutions and, the sim and, and, and even the symptoms, um, because those can be an avenue to get at the deep stories. There was a, a, a Zen master in Taiwan who I translated for briefly years and years and years ago, uh, a Chan master, they would say. Uh, and someone asked him, you know, about addressing the symptoms and, and stuff. And he said, yeah, he said, you know, you may think that if you want to eradicate a weed, you must pull it up by its root, right? Otherwise, it'll just grow back. But it's also true that if you only strip off the leaves enough times, then the root will die too. So I'm not saying that we should ignore, you know, the Keystone XL pipeline and, and these very superficial uh, expressions of the tide of separation. But we also need to work, I think, at the root level. So these stories of, of you know, technology making the world better and better, um, the story of, of um, life always speeding up, all of these stories are are built on that fundamental story that I mentioned before, that you know, we are separate individuals in a universe of other, in competition, uh, in a world. The essence of otherness is that the world outside ourselves does not possess the qualities of a self. It's just a bunch of stuff. Selfness is only in human beings, and maybe a little bit in animals, maybe at a rudimentary level in plants, but certainly not in rocks or water, or the sun or the moon or the planet or a mountain. These are just stuff. A jumble of chemicals. Most people who have lived on this planet didn't believe that. So I think, you know, all of us are attracted. Now I want to say two things at once. No, let me say the other one. I think that our visioning has to come from that level, uh, the level of rewriting the basic story of self and world. And it has many dimensions. Uh, and, you know, various among us are attracted to different pieces of it. One piece of it you can call interbeing, that says that our identity is not the uh, discrete separate self assumed by libertarianism, and, but not really by anarchism. And I think that the that more recent expressions of anarchism, I mean, even the older ones, they understand that the self is not um, a discrete, separate entity. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, that, that so interbeing says, no, you know, we are, like I said, the totality of our relationships, that, that everything uh, 
um, that's happening in the world is happening to us inescapably, not conditionally, not because, okay, like, is Fukushima happening to you or not? Well, the rational mind, the mind of separation says, well, maybe if you live on the West Coast, it is. Maybe if you live, live in Fukushima Prefecture in Japan, it's happening to you, but here it isn't. We can escape that because it's, this, it's happening in this external universe. But I don't think we can. I think that we only escape it temporarily by denying part of ourselves. It's the part of ourselves that feels hurt and anguish when we learn about what's happening at Fukushima. And there's some way that this, that this hemorrhaging of radiation mirrors something like, you know, like a wound inside of ourselves, too. That's uh, the understanding of interbeing, that what's happening to all beings is happening to us. Therefore, and it goes the other way, too. So what happens to us happens to all beings. And that's one piece of the what I you know like to call the new story, the new mythology, uh, that that we're all becoming attracted to. It, it's infiltrating our spirituality too, where it's no longer about you know perfecting oneself or this soul that is that and you can be perfected and and you know it doesn't really matter what other people are doing and you can walk around enlightened and you can be a powerful manifester, you know, a powerful new age manifester and have abundance because that is a product of your beliefs and it doesn't, you know, if somebody else is, is mired in negativity, well, you're just going to have to uh, uh, protect yourself from that person. You can exercise psychic protection. You know this whole kind of new age kind of, kind of thing, you know, that, that essentially really it's saying that you're separate from me. And I think that we're, we're beginning to move away from that, which is why the spiritual and the activist folks are converging. I could say a lot more about that, but um, I want to. <laughs> Robin wants me to, but, but I want to. Oh, well, some stuff can come up in Q and A too. Um, and so yeah, so an, an, another. I mean, I guess you could all say it's all interbeing. You know, another. Uh, expression of the idea of inner being is that, that the, like I said, the qualities of self are not limited to the self, but they're in everything. So we look upon the world as sacred, as having a quality of beingness. And that means that the mentality of conquest and of imposing human design onto this inert substrate, uh, this generic you know, there's a bunch of generic particles where any two samples of the same mineral are functionally identical and any two drops of water are, are the same. It's just H2O. It's just some stuff made up of particles that have no individuality. Um, that is no longer, uh, that's no longer a tenable approach to the world. And so what then? Where do we go when we realize that we can't just impose on the world and treat it as a bunch of stuff without suffering consequences ourselves? Where do we go with that? Well, so if we believe that there is uh, an order and a purpose and an intelligence outside of ourselves, and that doesn't mean that, that it's God, which is also separate from the material world. If you want to use the concept of God, you have to say that God is in everything, that everything is God. Um, so it's not, uh, I'm not arguing for, you know, this quality of spirit infiltrating dead generic matter. I'm saying that matter inherently, in and of itself, doesn't need an external thing called spirit because it is, is sacred. It has, it is being. It is self just as much of any, as any of us. That's what I'm saying. And if we believe that, then our relationship changes. And instead of imposing and conquering, we listen. 
and then you listen to what wants to happen, what wants to be born. And then the second step is to serve that thing. How do you serve it? How do you use your gifts in service? I was, um, last year when I was in, in, uh, in, in Turkey, I met this uh, Iranian guy whose grandfather was a Sufi architect. And he described this process very well. How did they build a mosque? The first step was that they would go sit at the plaza or wherever it was to be built. They would sit there and they would wait. Sit there for days, weeks, even months. Months until they saw the mosque that wanted to be built. But they did not say that I designed this mosque. No. What wants to happen? And this is a, a listening, a sensitivity that we are not used to. But it is the um, birthright and the uh, inextinguishable capacity of all human beings. But artists do it all the time, musicians do it all the time, listening to that which wants to happen through them, that which wants wants you to devote your gifts to it. Um, so I think just maybe I'll just kind of wrap it up now uh, by saying that the time is here for humanity uh, to uh, enter that relationship with nature as a co-creative partner and as a servant, uh, which certainly doesn't mean the um, abandonment of our gifts or the denial of our gifts, but it means turning them toward the purpose of service. Probably for the next couple hundred years, that simply means repairing the damage that has been done over the last few thousand years. And, and some of the most exciting things happening on this planet, to me at least, are, are exactly that. You know, the healing biotopes, you know, the uh, waste remediation techniques, uh, the, the people who are uh, reforesting areas that, have, that used to have forests generations ago or hundreds of years ago or even thousands of years ago, uh, that, that kind of work. Um, and so I think that that, that um, environmental and social healing is what is drawing our gifts today, which is different from, you know, 50 years ago. 50 years ago, what would draw your gifts would be uh, the culmination of the conquest of nature. Because separation, the story of separation, hadn't reached its extreme yet. You know, so if you were an ambitious, bright, altruistic young person, you know, you wanted to be an engineer or something like that, an astronaut. You know, that was what was exciting. Because that story that contained those aspirations was still strong. But now it's not strong anymore. And now we, the same young person now wants to go into permaculture. Um, something like that, yeah. Um, restorative justice, you know. Uh, working with, you know, the former incarcerated, you know. Um, healing of one sort or another. Healing bringing us back toward wholeness, toward reunion. Beyond that, I, maybe I won't right now offer a, uh, a vision beyond that. Because I think I'm not really sure if the time is quite here for a vision. I think that, that we still have to go through this break, breakdown phase where the old visions, the old conception of human destiny is obviously obsolete, and the new one hasn't manifest yet. And we're in that, um, that in-between space where we, where we return to reality, this, the, the reality that is not in any story at all, and we just feel the pain and the beauty, um, 
that's present all around us. Because that, that's what keeps us honest. You know, we come back to reality after having been lost in a story for a long time that has shielded us, calloused us from the consequences to other beings. There's a lot of uh, a lot of grief, you know, that hasn't been felt really on a cultural level, and it wants to be felt, you know, just the grief of the, uh, I mean, all of the extinct species, you know, the, the extermination of 99% of the original inhabitants of the continent, you know, um, the the dead languages and the the, the all of the uh, beautiful things that are gone. And I think until we really feel that, we're not going to have the foundation from which to create. There'll be this, this wound inside that's still not solid. Um, OK, so yeah, I think I'm just going to, uh, just going to end with a very short We call it a meditation, but if I do that, then everybody's going to like shift in their seats and close their eyes and, and get uncomfortable. But let's just let me just say, just to return to Jared's introduction, this idea that there's a purpose to all this, all of this technology that's built on itself and built on itself. This swelling of the human population to 7 billion, soon to be 8, 9, 10 billion. This, maybe, um, yeah, kind of feel into yourself for that, let's call it knowledge, that something is supposed to happen. Maybe it won't happen, but something is supposed to happen. There is a more beautiful world out there as a possibility, as a potentiality in the future. And just touch into that knowledge, which can be an irrational, unreasonable knowledge. And it can exist alongside the doubt the despair and the cynicism, they're both there at the same time. In me, for sure. Bring to mind one of the glimpses that you might have had of this more beautiful world. That uplifting, exhilarating moment. Yeah, this is how life's supposed to be. Possible. In that moment, you knew it. It's so easy, maybe. Simple. It's just about love. It's just about letting go. In that moment, you knew it. And that's a lie they knew. And just spend a little while present to that and that cloud. doubt, cynicism, despair. It's not rational, it's not practical, it's naive. And there's that cloud around the glowing knowledge. And sometimes the cloud parts and the knowledge radiates out. There it is. All right. Thank you for your attention.